when you invited us to reflect on our unease in your hypotheticals about, are you okay with China being a, uh, you know, uh, a larger trade partner with the United States compared to Canada? It wasn't just free-floating theoretical notion. I mean, the idea that um, a global trading system that allows our semiconduct, many of our advanced semiconductors to be built in Taiwan, which is about 100 miles from mainland China, and the Chinese um, national security posture right now, it's a real concern, wouldn't you say, by Americans? Of course, and I think for anyone who wasn't convinced it was a real concern, the events that happened a year ago um, in Ukraine has convinced them as well, um, particularly when there was the announcement about a friendship without limits certainly a few weeks before that. And I'll point out that third question that I posed, that was not a hypothetical, right? China is the leading trade partner of many of our key security allies in the Asia Pacific region. It's, it's, it's so interesting to reflect. Uh, wait, remind me though, the uh, friendship without limits was an agreement between who? No, it was just a comment that was made at the Olympics. Between, at the Olympics, right. Uh, President yeah. Xi and President Putin. Putin. That's right. It was, it was that, yes. <laughs> and we discussed that here as well. Dr. Chibber, to just go directly to some of your last points about the great renewable greening of the uh, Indian economy that would be necessary. A um, lot of work to do. Your slide showed all the work that needed to be done. Is there political will in that country? We have those issues in this country. Yeah, so I think, so the, the good, uh, the positive thing on this is that only about 20, 25% of the capacity that we will need is, in, is on the ground at the moment. So 75 to 80%. So we don't have strand, a lot of stranded assets. You know, the scale of the energy needs will be so large that you know, the, it's all going to be new investment. So it's going to depend on two things. What kind of technology transfer takes place and uh, what kind of financing comes in. If it's very expensive money, of course, India will, will it'll go much slower. I think having made the commitment at, um, at Glasgow uh, when Prime Minister Modi announced the net zero, I think uh, that commitment has been made. And I don't think there's any political ambivalence on this. I mean, the, the Congress party and the other parties will all want to go along with this. Today, uh, you know, solar is actually quite cost competitive per unit cost. Uh, it's the it's the plonking down of the infrastructure that's needed, that is where the cost big costs are. And I think there, if we can leverage all this capital that sits around the world, basically underutilized, with low rates of return, uh, which was the case till till we interest rates started rising a, a year or so ago. But nevertheless, there's a lot of capital that could be then redeployed. And uh, I've also made a strong case for the reform of the Bretton Woods institutions to be the lever for that, uh, the kind of Archimedean lever for that transfer. IMF, World Bank. Yes. And David, if I may, right, the question you just posed um, highlights right, the assertion that I was making in my argument. Right? Because if you look at it, right, where would that technology transfer come from? What is the cheapest source of cheap solar, right? offshore wind? Um, who's putting in place technologies for smart cities, especially cities that are in developing countries that are densely populated and so forth? A lot of that would come from China. And it would be a question, uh, also the development financing. Right? And it would be a question right, that I think is the same type of insecurity question that's being posed there, where you understand you know, in your head, you need to get to this type of transition. You're going to pay a huge cost and so forth. There are gains to be made from cooperation here. But, you know, deep down, there is, I think, the same unease if we ask this question in an auditorium uh, somewhere in 
when pick an Indian state, right? Uh, that would be the equivalent of Maine. I don't know what that would be. Uh, maybe Andhra Pradesh or somewhere like that. Uh, and uh, you'd, um, you know, it, it highlights, right, this is not just a uniquely American question that we're facing when we're talking about moving towards a different mode of trade governance. But, you know, I, I don't want to uh, jump ahead, but I just want to say uh, I, don't, I think the level of trust in India and China is even lower than in Japan and South Korea. And uh, Modi has tried to make friends with Xi for a long time. And yet, uh, we, we cannot, we have a hot border. I don't think the Indians are interested in being dependent on China for solar or for anything else. Uh, one of the PLI sectors, the subsidy sectors and industrial policy is uh, solar equipment. So uh, if there's a joke, you know, who lost India in the forbidden city? And the answer is no, it was she. <laughs> <laughs> Volunteer one, you have a question from this audience? Charlotte Singleton, Mount Desert Island. Um, I have a question for Dr. Wu. Um, would you tell us how you view sanctions at this point? You were talking about the security orientation. Well, what would, what, where and when and how would sanctions be useful? How do you view sanctions of China? Uh, so, or, or, excuse me, or for any other country. Oh, really, any, it's more broad. Else. Okay, any other country. So uh, I think sanctions are most effective when you're able to cut off all of the different sources. Um, if uh, sanctions, right, so sanctions, you can either basically choke off everything or you're basically choking off some, but you're essentially, um, it's like a hydraulic system, right? You choke off this part, it's just gonna flow elsewhere. So I think for sanctions to be really effective, it needs to be done in a coordinated fashion with allies who um, all, uh, basically you need to organize, right, the main sources of input to do that. So you can see sanctions are effective in some domains where there are only one or two or three providers of a technology or a capital and so forth, but where it's readily substitutable, there are many different ways by which to uh, evade that. And I think whether you're talking about Iran sanctions, currently Russia sanctions and so forth, we are not able to mobilize the entire world together. Um, certainly you're sending a normative message of what you think is uh, not correct, but uh, the economic cost is yet to be borne. Mm -hmm. Any uh, volunteer three, you have someone with a raised hand. Tell us your name. Good afternoon, my name is Vita. I'm from University of Maine School of Policy and International Affairs, and also I'm from Ukraine. And uh, thank you both for your, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for your uh, incredible presentations. I have more questions for Professor Mark Wu. So in your presentation, you mentioned that trade uh, that leads to uh, interdependency can lead to security what in the same time when trade leads just to dependency leads to insecurity and I think uh, we really perfectly saw the second uh, idea just recently when we saw how European Union was relying on Russian gas and what happened after Russian invasion on Ukraine and my question is uh, can be kind of blurry because of future but it relates uh, to trade relations how world should respond after the war finishes in trade in terms of trade relation in Russia? Uh, should world make Russia trade and economical outcast and just because of security close all the deals or vice versa? Uh, it's been said in the morning uh, lectures that uh, economic integrity also leads to security. So should world vice versa uh, include Russia in and make economically integrity country, what can be also threat to security because we know that the more power Russia gets, it can, be, it can go to weaponizing and also to further threats to other countries. So a question about a, a kind of post-war future, yes. which is nice that we're talking about even such a thing a year later here. Um, and uh, there'll be uh, a global discussion about reintegrating Russia or not. Do you have thoughts? Uh, I, I have one simple thought, right, which is we don't know the answer to this until we win the war. And whether or not that war is going to be won and what the terms of that settlement of peace 
are going to be are going to determine what type of economic integration that will be. But I think we are here a year later, and we're still seeing um, some very entrenched fighting on, throughout. Um, and we um, don't have any idea of what the peace settlement, negotiated settlement might be. And I think as many have stated, that's a real question for the Ukrainian people to decide. Um, hopefully, they'll be in a position to decide that. Um, I think we have the lessons of World War I hanging over our heads to know uh, that you know, should you not integrate and should you um, also right, create animosity, um, historical grievances, um, that will come back to bite you. But it does uh, still result um, in a peace settlement that will undo uh, the breach of international law that we've seen uh, over the past couple of years. I remember talking to um, the editor of a big global publication, and th this is after Russia's uh, war on Ukraine began, and their two most trusted journalists on staff, one was the international affairs editor, and one was the, a person who had run the Moscow Bureau for a long time, okay? Two people who knew what was going on. One said to the editor, there's no way Putin will do this. And one said, of course he's gonna do this. But one has to believe the argument that he would never do it was the trade connections with the rest of the world. And in this case, we've seen which equation works. It's not the one that says that necessarily closer interdependence equals more security. Yeah, and I think that's a real mindset shift, right? And I think that's a mindset shift for everyone sitting in this room as well. And it's a question then, if that paradigm shift has happened, how long is that paradigm gonna last and what type of um, arrangements are you gonna make in the interim until you can get back to the previous paradigm, if ever? Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate the optimism, um, but I, I think we have a long ways to go uh, a year out. We're certainly in a better position than we would have envisioned had someone tossed out this hypothetical at this conference last year, but, um, but I think we have a long ways to go. Volunteer One, tell us your name. Uh, Ron Bancroft, Cumberland. So, Dr. Chibber, I, I was shocked a little bit at your uh, comment on Indian education. You know, having been involved in business in this country for a long time and having this wonderful uh, set of colleagues, all from India, or many from India, in, in, uh, in our technology and business organizations, what is the story there? Uh, is this a brain drain from India? Are people coming back? Yeah. Uh, are you missing that... Uh, that capability. Yeah, so it goes back to when we started. Um, we, Prime Minister Nehru was very focused on higher education. With American help, he set up the, with MIT and others, the Indian Institutes of Technology, uh, where very high class people have emerged from those institutes largely, but then can't find good jobs in India. And this, this is a lot of the growth is jobless growth. So they all come here and stay here. And the US has a very smart immigration policy and it keeps them and, and then takes full advantage of them. What he did was then he neglected primary education. So the mass of people don't have that, that benefit. Over time, we've managed to now get the enrollment rate, uh, even in primary education, up to 90, 95% now. And girl, girl education has also gone up. But the learning um, is very poor. And we have surveys after surveys showing how poor it is. I just gave you a glimpse of one slide of that. My book has more. But so that's where the shift is taking, it has to take place now. But unless we solve the governance problem that I talked about, because you see, unless the village council and the local administration is responsible for running the schools, the teachers are being paid, they don't show up. Uh, teacher quality is, is not monitored properly. 
So those are the kind of things that have to take place. We, we've just announced a new education policy. So yeah, so a lot of that is brain drain and a lot of those people who are running all these big corporations <laughs> could have been back there developing India as well. I'm not blaming them. You know, these are the choices people have to make for their personal lives, uh, like all of us do. But the, the overall reality is that uh, we've uh, focused on a small minority of people who had very high class education, but then can't get jobs, so they come. And then a large mass of people who we need for, uh, for, our, for, for manufacturing, for you know, assembly line and factories that are not available. So just to give you one figure, um, you know, skilled employment is, in India is only 4% of the total actual employment. So there are a lot of unemployed people, but of those that are employed, only 4% have, skill, uh, have skills as say compared to Korea, which I mean 80, 90%, 95% probably are skilled. So that tells you where investment will go because if you don't have that skilled labor, then you won't attract the investment either. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated circle of things, but our education policy certainly needs a huge, huge fix. You know. uh, just by the way, because uh, most people here, not every, are, deeply immersed in the American political context, when you made a plea for smaller government in the India context, yes. um, that's not exactly the same as the same phrase you hear in the United States. There's a different scale of government involvement in, um, uh, than in the US, or is it, would you regard it as equivalent? No, when, yeah, it's a, com it's a- Completely different, right? Completely different. It's, so, we still have 250 very large public sector companies. They've managed to sell one, Air India, but we have another 250 of them um, producing botches, you know, sometimes even bread and butter and stuff like that. So we need privatization on a large scale. We need commercialization on a large scale, which is a lot of our utilities should be commercialized so that they don't run huge losses. And then we have a regulatory system which is uh, not only overbearing, but it is a mass of regulation that often contradicts each other. So new regulation will be passed and then the old one won't be done away with. Then you have regulation at the central and at the state level which often doesn't mesh. So if you're an investor coming in uh, you not only have, you have to deal with all of this. Most people then end up with a local partner who navigates their way through all of this. So the much simpler way would be to, you know, clean it up. And uh, so as I said, the size of government isn't very large as to this expenditure to GDP. Uh, the number of people working there isn't very large, but uh, they're involved in too many things and they're often, too many at the central level, not enough at the local level. So, so you end up with a kind of boutique government. You pay them a lot of money, but you know you could get much cheaper work done at the lower level too. Volunteer one, you have a question. That, and the mic goes over to. Tell us your name and where Hi, you're from. Hi, I'm Emily. I go to Bates College, um, and I kind of have a question uh, to Professor Chiber to see. Um, so I've, if IPCC has stated that by 2070, the carbon dioxide will be by two degrees and it will nev negatively impact the planet. So I would please like to understand why and how do you believe India will achieve net zero emissions by 2070? Yeah, did you didn't say that it would achieve it? No, so that's the goal that the they goal would is... like to achieve, right? So. If you manage to shift a lot of our energy needs to renewables, say 70, 75% to solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, we, we also have a nuclear option, um, and less from coal, uh, then of course, you know, you, you could, and then we, the slide, the last slide I showed you showed phase out of coal, right? 
So we get out of coal. Of course, there could be other technologies, carbon sequestration, whatever. I mean, you know, you can think of many things that we don't know about between now and 2070. But that's the goal. You want to uh, by and that's what they would like to achieve. You want and to achieve it by 2070. That's my question. 2070 is what they've stated as. So China said 2060. Mm -hmm. Some other countries have said 2050. But given India's stage of development, it said we need a little more time. Also, we have a lot of people who don't have access to electricity. We don't have, you know, have no power at all. They go collect firewood. Mostly it's the women who go collect firewood to uh, cook the food and heat the home. So uh, we, we have to connect all those people. So all of that taken together, the government has still said, OK, we commit that by 2070. Despite all the experts telling Mr. Modi not to make that commitment, he went ahead and made that commitment. So it's done now. And therefore, they have to go for that now. There's no choice. Um, and I don't think the next, if the next government is not a BJP government, not a, they will not go back on that. We will be hurt, because India will also be hurt very badly by climate change. So we don't want to cut our nose to spite our own face. We have the Himalayas where the glaciers are melting. David has been there. I have been there. Uh, we have uh, sea level rising. A lot of our coastal cities are being affected. We have you know, a lot of issues on desertification. So we have the challenges. And South Asia is hugely vulnerable. We're in terrible competition with each other. We both made documentaries <laughs> about, uh, yeah. about, about water in the Himalayas and food security in the context of climate change. I'm sure his is way better. Um, in the back, Volunteer 2 has a question. Uh, hello. Thank you very much, uh, both professors. Uh, so my name is Alan Hoen Chang. I'm from Taiwan. I'm also a student uh, studying at UMaine in School of Policy and International Affairs. And this question is actually to both Professor Wu and uh, Professor Chiber. So um, I really agree with the, uh, prof Dr. Professor Wu's, um, the way that you mentioned the results and also uh, the approaches that could be uh, combating like this kind of digital security considering this uh, technological uh, development and also uh, the international trade. And I was also uh, thinking about this uh, sector-specific agreements that you mentioned, uh, like related to the regional uh, agreements that could possibly be formed, or we perhaps already uh, have some successful or like emerging examples that we could follow. And I also uh, really agree with um, Dr. Cheeber's um, comments on the development in India, instead of just the industrial uh, improvement of the growth, but also from the fundamental part, that is the education, the human development. Yeah. And as a high school teacher for as my career, I, I'm also like joining some uh, workshops on campus and discussing with uh, educational development group about is that only like a specific subject matter that we are teaching our students or should we like really also um, include incorporated this kind of ethical education in all the subject matters. So, you know, like, um, I was not self-efficacy, but like the India's um, saying, saying that they will um, join the, the world to help the world, to uh, support the world. Um, some of our like student groups, like led by doctor, that we also raised some of the funds for the earthquake happening recently in the Middle East. And I was thinking, for all this uh, world changing and happening, uh, the regional or the sector specific agreements, can we see like Europe or like the European Union as one of the examples? Because I know there are like debates about the American federalism and the European. Uh, so, the, so the question, thank you for this, yes, is yes. So, to, to Sorry, what extent can we uh, look at the Europeans as a model for uh, uh, the type of development that would make in your framing or someone else's framing or the Mr. Tata's framing uh, a country uh, happier? happier? Yeah, I think uh, Europe is a great uh, role model for us. Uh, I, I don't know if people know that 
uh, you know, the difference between me and somebody in the south of India is just like the difference between somebody in um, the Nordic countries and in um, Spain or in Greece. I mean, we speak completely different languages. Uh, some of our languages have a common root, which is Sanskrit. M many of them do, but some don't. So I, will, I am totally at a loss if I go to the south of India and in terms of language. So we have 15, 16 major languages, and then all the diversity on religion. So uh, in that, and we are called the Indian Union. It's a, it's a federation of union, uh, union of states. So it's a unitary government in that sense. But we have to learn a lot from Europe on uh, how to move ahead on um, you know, business policies. But also, I, I didn't have time to show the slides on the safety nets. But your question has given me that opportunity. Our safety nets are still very much what I call product-based. So we subsidize food, and during COVID, uh, we gave free food to 80 million people to help them survive, which is a good thing. But we need to move away from uh, product-based subsidies to, uh, and safety nets to cash-based and income transfer programs. Uh, they have started some. And so we, you know, gradually we have to modernize the safety net and move in that direction while pushing ahead with business-friendly policies and economic uh, <coughs> policies that will pull in the investment that might dislocate also people. But if you have that safety net properly designed. So yeah, Europe is great for us, by the way, yeah. So one of the benefits of the format here is that we get all the speakers back up tomorrow and there'll be further questions of this wonderful panel. So let us all thank, before we go to break, Mark Wu and Ajay Kidder. Okay.